There's a phrase in Thai, Ten Song Bhat. And the story behind it is this. It was a monk who, every day when he went out for alms round, would pick up his bowl, look at it, and then take it down and carry it as he normally would. And there was an old man who was hoping to be ordained. He noticed this. And so when he ordained, every morning he'd pick up his bowl, look at it, put it down, carry it normally. And someone asked him one day why he did that. And he said, I don't know. That's what the monk did. Well, it turned out the monk was looking in the bowl to see if there was a hole in it. Held it up to the sky, so if there's any light came in, he'd know. But the old man had never stopped to think, well, what was the reason for that? And so the phrase, Tain Song Bad, is what someone who goes through the motions but has no idea why he's doing it. One of the basic lessons you have to learn when you go to Thailand is that not everything is going to be explained. A lot of the teaching is meant for you to exercise your own discernment, try to figure it out. And as a result, of course, different people will exercise their discernment in different ways, come up with different conclusions. But in many cases, if the student is well-intentioned and has some integrity, whatever the solution he or she comes up with is going to be useful, it's going to be good. You listen to the teachings of Ajahn Mahabua, some of the details in his explanation of how things work, especially among the aggregates, go one way. You listen to Ajahn Lee, it goes another way. But they're both very useful. Ajahn Lee talks about how you start out with a perception, a sanya, and then you fabricate something out of it. Ajahn Mahabua talks about there being a little stirring in the mind, which is the beginning of a sankara or fabrication, and you slap a sanya on it to give it some meaning. And they're both right. And their analysis, in each case, is a very useful one, something that they have to figure out for themselves. It's one of the basic lessons you've got to keep in mind is when a good teacher does something, there's a reason. And the reason may not be explained. And you don't just write it off as, well, this is the way Thai people do it. And you'll go along with it as long as you're in Thailand, but then you'll drop it when you come back. And I've seen too many Western monks doing just that. They didn't put the energy into learning that was required. Because you are learning a skill over there, and a lot of, a lot of skill means you're not just memorizing texts. We're trying to get the words right. You're learning how to figure out the problems in your own mind. And as many of the teachers would say, if they if you get used to having things handed to you on a platter, you get lazy. So that's why some of the teachings are a little cryptic or unexplained. It's for you to try to figure out. John Mahabu has a nice talk about studying with a John Mun. I mean, Listen to a Dharma talk by John Munn, and he'd trip over a couple of phrases. Couldn't make heads or tails of them, so he'd go and think about them for three days. And they go and ask a John Munn. He said, this, this point you made the other night in the Dharma talk, I've been thinking about it for three days and can't make heads or tails of it. And John Munn would smile a little bit and say, oh, so there's someone actually thinking about what I say? And then John Mahabua would say yes, not with any intelligence, he said, but doing my best. And then he'd tell John Mun what he thought the meaning was. And then John Mun would smile a little bit and say, well, we, all don't, we don't come into the world with everything all figured out. He never would explain whether what John Mahabua said was right or wrong, which is interesting. But the whole purpose was to encourage the student to try to figure things out. So as you're practicing the Dharma, you want to notice, because not everything is going to be explained. One of John Fuang's comments was that as a student you have to be think like a thief. You're going to st steal something from a house. You don't go up to them, knock on the door and ask them, well, when are you going to be away and where do you keep your valuables? You have to notice the people. Watch the house. 
hide yourself so you're not too obvious, and then see when do they come, when do they go every day. And sometimes you can figure out where they are in the house, where the valuables might be. You've got to figure it out on your own. You know that famous story of John Lee not being able to arrange John Munn's room properly. John Munn would always say, well, all the things are in the wrong places, but he wouldn't say where the right places were. So John Lee had to find another way to learn it. Learn this, and what he did was, because it was a bamboo leaf hut, he was able to poke a hole in the bamboo leaves of the wall. He'd arrange the room, then leave. And John Munn would go in, and John Lee was watching through the bamboo leaf wall. Notice where a John Munn would change things, where he would place them when he wanted them, and right where he wanted them. John Lee took note of that, and the next day he tried to arrange things just that way. Then went out and looked through the, bam the hole in the bamboo leaf again. Sure enough, a John Munn came in, looked left, right, didn't change anything, didn't even turn over his sitting cloth. Just bowed down and said his chance. And John Lee felt really satisfied that he would figured out that problem. So a large part of the practice is learning how to figure things out for yourself, with the conviction there is a reason. It's not just cultural. And one of the things I appreciated most about the Thai forest tradition when I went over there was it stood a little bit on the outside of Thai society. And of course all the people there were Thai or Lao. But to learn how to step outside the attitudes that they'd grown up with and the values of society at large. And the way things were run was run with a set of reasons. So as you're practicing, keep reminding yourself, okay, there are reasons for this. There are reasons why the rules are this way. There are reasons why there are these customs and protocols we have around the monastery. And it's all there for you to figure out. Because after all, when you sit down with your own mind, there are a lot of things you're going to have to figure out. We're not here just to just accept the way things are and be okay with that and leave it there. Think about the Buddha's last word. And I mean that last word, not so much last words. It's a peculiarity of English and Thai syntax that when the Buddha's last phrase was, is translated, the word heedfulness comes at the end. In English, it's achieve completion or achieve consummation through heedfulness. And in Thai, it's But in Pali, the last word is achieve completion, achieve consummation, sampade ta. And the basic message there is that there are things that you've got to master. We're not just here to accept things. Acceptance is the beginning of, in other words, you accept where you are and that you are there, but that there's work that needs to be done, and you do have the abilities to do it. And part of the reason why you're stuck where you are is because of some actions on your own part as well. That's something you also have to accept. But you're not stuck there. The whole point of the practice is to make you grow. And sometimes you grow by listening, and sometimes you grow by thinking, and sometimes you grow by developing qualities in the mind. I mean, that's how discernment, all the three ways that discernment is developed. But the completion here is you want to complete all the factors of the path. You want to complete all the good qualities in the mind. The heedfulness is the motivation. that puts you in that direction, because you realize that if you don't act in a skillful way, there's going to be trouble. If you act in a skillful way, you're going to be able to overcome that trouble, get past that trouble. But there is work to be done. And so you look at yourself where you are. What needs to be brought to consummation? What's still lacking? The opposite of Sampade tower. The adjective for that is sampano. The opposite of the adjective is vipano, is a defect. Where are your defects? Probably they talk about having a defect in virtue, a defect in conduct, a 
defect in your views, which parts need to be worked on. If you're still suffering, there's, that means there's something needs to be done. There's something. There's a defect in your behavior. So look for that. And sometimes you can see them, and sometimes you can't. Someone once made the comment that our defilements are kind of like ghosts. One of the old ways of checking if someone was a ghost or not was you looked in the mirror. If they didn't appear in the mirror, they're sure you're a ghost. Okay, when you look at yourself, it's hard to see your defilements. Another reason why we all need teachers is they can look at our defilements and they see them very clearly. But they want to train us to learn how to see them for ourselves. Sometimes they'll point them out directly, and other times they'll put us in a situation where the only way we're going to get out of that situation is if we learned how to admit that, yes, we approach things in an unskillful way. We've got to figure out some other way of doing it. So again, this is why they try to teach you to develop your ingenuity in figuring out problems. And John Fuang's two main words, as I've said many times. One, be observant. Two, use your ingenuity. Look at what you're doing. Try to look at the results. And if the results aren't good enough, try to figure out what's wrong with what you're doing. And that's how the Buddha gained awakening to begin with. You look at his autobiography. I come along to a particular problem and I ask myself, well, why am I doing this? When I do this, the results aren't good. Is there another way? It was his willingness to accept the fact that his behavior was not up to snuff. It was not yet consummate. It's not yet skillful enough. So I try to figure out something else. These are the habits that are developed by developing skills. This is one of our big drawbacks here in the West. We're not a society of skills. We're a society of consumers. Part of this huge social experiment where they put a box in our house and it keeps telling us that you're miserable, you're lacking this, you're lacking that, but if you buy our stuff then you'll be happy. And of course it makes miserable people. People who, on the one hand, as consumers, expect to be able to say, I want this this way and I want that that way, and the corporations are all too happy to comply. But it all comes out of this sense of low self-esteem and not much ingenuity on our part. Simply, we want a quick fix for our low self-esteem. But that doesn't work in the practice. Try to think of whatever skills you've developed, manual skills, either sport, music, carpentry, whatever. Try to bring the attitude that got you skillful in that way to the meditation. Now, if you don't have any skills like that, you've got a problem. You have to consciously remind yourself, okay, I'm here to learn something. I'm here to look at my actions. Learn how to read the results of my actions so I can figure out what's wrong, so I can change them. This is why so much of the training is self-training, because you're the only one who knows that you're suffering, how much you're suffering, where you're suffering, how it is. The hard part is learning to look at your actions and see the connection between cause and effect. But if you keep reminding yourself, that's where the problem is, and, that's, and your ingenuity is where the solution is going to lie, then you understand again why the teachers in the forest tradition keep setting up problems and not explaining them. Sometimes you don't even know you're being tested. So watch carefully. Remember, we are here to develop skills to become consummate, to become masters in the skills. Always keep the Buddha's last word in mind. 